going, oh my goodness, I was so busy saying hello to everyone that I forgot what time it was. Welcome, I'm Susan Winter, and this is Love Advice, and I'm continuing live to talk about things that I think are pertinent to all of us in life and hopefully to help all of you. And I, I opened up this morning and I see so many people chatting. And so today we are talking about bouncing back from rejection. So before anybody does a super chat, I will ask you to please, please do not click super chat for at least 10 minutes. Let me get through the exposition so that I can speak to all of you and give you a little bit of background. First of all, for the first time people coming today, Xavier and the rest of you, welcome. This is a safe place to learn about yourself, to get agency over your life, and to know exactly what you're doing in relationships so that you have a choice and welcome everybody. Hi, Ben Minneapolis, Genetic Freak. Hi, everyone. And thank you, especially to my moderators, Alex Flips, Alex Flips, B for Boats, and B Ray. I just really, really appreciate all of you. So um, let's talk about this. First of all, rejection. We are all going to experience rejection in our lives. We're going to get turned down for the credit card we want. We might get turned down from the country club or the private club or the thing that we think is so cool that we want to be a part of. We're not going to be able to be a part of it. We might get turned down for the job we want. We may not get the promotion we want. And in love, we may not get the outcome that we want. We have to learn how to deal with this. The object of this game is not to go sideways and never play because you're incapacitated. What we need to do is learn the skill of resilience because it's not just in love, it can be in friendships, all sorts of things go through changes. I'm gonna widen my screen here so I can, well, I'm seeing more of myself. I wanted to see more of all of you. Um, the timing for this uh, session is perfect after he just got rejected by my friend. So yes, we can be rejected by friends. I've rejected friends. You know, uh, so we have to, first of all, let's understand that this is a part of life. Life changes, circumstance change, input changes, and we change accordingly. So the relationships, the jobs, where we lived, whatever, all this seems good in one time, it cannot be good in another time. And we have to learn to flow with it. Number two, you know, when we are looking for stability, and that's what all of us crave when we go out into the dating world, we want to know that we're safe. And yet we have to accept the fact that we're in an unpredictable realm. Those of you who come here, we learn the skills of understanding ourselves. We learn how to communicate. We learn boundaries. We learn what are red flags. We learn how to make a proper selection, partnership selection, choosing the right mate so that we don't repeat a negative pattern. We start to learn how to do that. Yet at the same time, there are other skills that we have to learn in there because it's never, ever, no matter how good our planning, no matter how much we know, we have this incredibly unpredictable other factor, which is the other person. They're whimsical. People, people can be nutty at times. People can be inconsistent. Half the time that you want to know what your partner is doing, I bet you they don't know why they did it themselves. We'd love to have everybody do the inner work. We'd love to have them be self-aware. Some of them are not. Um, growth mindset really helps because at least the two of you can talk about it. But understand that our need for stability and safety and security, which is underlying all of our romantic relationships, will constantly be tested by the fact that relationships and emotions and humans are growing. Therefore, the design is fluid. We will never be able to lock someone in and say, I know they're going to stay forever. Now, granted, how many of you are like, no, 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 Susan. My grandparents have been together. They celebrated their 65th wedding anniversary, but they were partnered in a time where there was not great selection. There wasn't great mobility. Women didn't have economic security. There were a lot of incentives to stay in the relationship. I'm not saying it was a bad relationship. They may have had a great relationship, but given their time and their mindset, that was one, that was the norm. We have to accept that while we may want that as the ideal, that there is a changing world around us. So the best we can do is to prepare ourselves to create the kind of longevity that we want, but understand that along the way, there will be rejection. And by the way, by the way, 
How do you know that the person that you feel is rejecting you, that you haven't dodged a bullet? Really? I mean, really, when you really, 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 really think about it, when somebody is really meant for you and they are truly committed to you and they want you and they're motivated and they're locked and loaded, they don't shirk that easily. They don't hit a bump and go, oh, I'm out of here. They don't go, oh, well, this one looks better. I don't know what I feel. They're not like that. A really true committed partner who wants you will go through hell and high water as you would for them because they see the value in the relationship. So let's not overvalue those people who are rejecting us. I'm so happy that this seems to be uh, a bit of a, something you want to talk about today. Let me continue with some of the overview and then I'll open it up to your super chat. Okay, so how do we do this? How, what's our first tool in our tool belt? For me, I want you all to really think about changing the narrative. Were you rejected? Yes. Can you personalize it? Question mark. Let's start with personalization because we're going to change the narrative. If you personalize the rejection, you might be overvaluing what they were considering. You know, we don't know that it's a rejection of you as an individual. It's not that you're defective or faulty. You may not be what they want to experience. They may not want to experience anything. You may have been playtime. They may have never been interested in a committed relationship. They may be so ADD when it comes to their own dating life that they can't focus on anybody. How do we know anybody is going to get that spot? Okay. And for those of you who are going, oh, no, 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 Susan, I got rejected by my partner and that partner immediately hooked up with somebody else and got married. Okay. They were the right connection. If, if that person is not that committed to you to begin with, that would have happened anyway. So you, you really can't lose what isn't yours. I mean, we feel like we do. Of course, it is not what we desire. We want to twist the world to conform to our desires. And the problem with that is as mere humans, sometimes we are really missing a greater gift. We are not trusting the grand director. And you don't have to have a spiritual philosophy. I'm not going there. I'm just saying that even if you're just scientifically looking at this, this is kind of magical. Life, kind of magical. When you look at it, it's really, I mean, it's amazing. It, it, it's something that maybe is a little bit wiser than we are and crafted with a little bit more intelligence than we could do. So I tend to think on the spectrum of consciousness, human beings are evolving, but I don't think we're the be all and end all. And so sometimes we have to trust that there is a process that is better for us. This is part of changing the narrative. Is it wishful thinking? Honestly, Here's what I like. If I adopt a philosophy that is not completely delusional, but it serves me well, makes me a happy, healthy person, and I'm better functioning in life, and I can handle the ups and downs, and I can tuck and roll in life, aren't I a better human being having a better experience here? So if I choose a philosophy that aids me and gives me the more positive spin on it, I think I'm better off for it. Should I be a cynic? Is that going to help me? Will I be a happier person? Will my life be better because of it? Am I going to say, oh, but I'm an intellectual, I'm a cynic, and so therefore, blah, 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 blah. That sounds like a really miserable life to me. I just think that if we can try, try, try to look for a gift, that loss will not register as loss. I don't know about you, but I have been through so much pain in my life. If I let these things that have happened to me stay with me, I would never be able to survive. And what if they weren't purposeful and a part of the carving of my personality? What if they weren't intentional to create depth? We don't want to continue with this. We're not saying, hey, world, give me a lot of challenges so I can have a lot of depth. But what we're saying is when I get an outcome that I don't want, how can I somehow make it work for me so that I can transit through it, still have optimism, still have faith in myself, and still have faith in love and humanity? Okay, so this is kind of where I'm going. I think I got off a little bit <laughs> into a philosophy. Another thing that's going to help you, 
Stop repeating negative patterns. You will find yourself rejected if you are choosing from a pool of people that are the same as the ones who've hurt you in the past. So this is where we need to be aware. Are you walking into a relationship and three times in a row you've had your partner cheat on you? You may want to look at the one active factor there. It doesn't mean you're worth cheating on. doesn't mean you're not valuable. It means that somehow you are attracted to and attracting people that have that vibe and that frequency. And this is where we want to alter our partner selection. If you keep getting the same negative results, you've got to stand back, do your due diligence, look at your patterns and say, wow, I do like bad boys. Don't like to admit it to myself, but I do. Ooh, I do like that wild girl. Jeez, I know she's trouble. She's like a black widow spider, but oh, so good in bed. And you know, then you just have to say, if I choose that, I know what I'm going to get. Can I handle it? Am I resilient enough? Or have I had enough of this ride and I want to try something differently? So the tools are to try to spin it so that you find a benefit. Remember, if they're not yours, they're not yours. And if they're not meant to spend time with you, all that's twisting and turning, square peg in a round hole, it's we spend so much time trying to work at these relationships, so much time trying to work it out and work it out. Did it ever occur to you, maybe this isn't the right person? <laughs> I mean, really? Okay, so, um, and another thing, this rejection might not be about you. Again, it goes back to the personalization. Okay, maybe they're not open to love. Maybe they're a hot and cold person that's an avoidant. Maybe they're a player. Maybe they're a narcissist. Maybe they're fearful. Who cares? They're not in it the same way you are. So this is a no-go. All right? So I want to really help everybody. And we have to learn these skills. Don't be afraid of it. Please, please, please don't reject dating and love and relationships because you get a boo-boo. Okay, please. The task is not to run away from it. The task is to move through it and learn another skill so that you don't have to repeat it again. Now, <laughs> talk to me. I'm open. Oh, love from Romania. Oh, Laura, we're going to be in Romania. My friend and I are going to be there at the end of August. We are going from Budapest to Bucharest. And um, we uh, are going to be there. So stay in touch with us, Laura Horea. Um, let's see. Joanna, you've had enough. Uh, Susan, lots of hugs. Thank you. Um, oh, this is so beautiful. Justin says, beauty needs a witness. Here's to all the women here who are letting Susan grow roses on their soul. Oh, that's so beautiful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We have our first super chat. Hi, Gary Harris, $10. Thank you, Susan. And there's a little heart here. Well, it's a flower. I had a person from my past reject me. She said that she didn't want to be the person to hurt me. Okay, that's, that's good. She seemed immature after reflecting. I'm a rather nice guy with a friendly personality, Gary. So it sounds like you're over it. And, and, you know, when we're first dating, if you're saying she's immature, when I was first dating in my teens and 20s, I hurt people. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't, I didn't want anything. I was just mucking about. I didn't realize the power of catalyzing love. I didn't realize that I could create this profound attachment from another person, uh, their attachment of me. I didn't realize what I was playing with. I was completely unaware. For that, please forgive me, Bill and Paul and some of the other guys that I just didn't do the right thing by because I was a teenager and young, young woman in my 20s. But once my heart was broken, I learned very quickly the power that we have to attract and create love, and especially for an open and warm person. And then when you get fickle and you get tired of that person, but I didn't have the language. I didn't have the knowledge. We didn't even have these discussions back then. We didn't even have sex education. So um, 
it sounds like she didn't want to hurt you, Gary. I love the fact that you're a nice guy with a friendly personality. That's a plus. Please don't lose that. Please don't become cynical. Please don't hate dating and hate the world as a protective mechanism. It's really kind of a weak move. So whenever we we see somebody and they're very guarded and they're very negative and all this, they may look, uh, this aloof demeanor may look incredibly powerful, like, oh, they're super intellectual. And, oh, my goodness, they're so hard to please. And maybe I can get them to approve of me. And it's just, it is weakness with layered with weakness, layered with weakness. It's, it's a shell to protect themselves. You're so much more powerful if you know how to deal with it and you go out into the world and you have a skill set and you're willing to take it on. And you're willing to get knocked down once in a while. Imagine you're playing a contact sport and you're like, but don't hit me. Don't hit me. It's I, I want to play football. Is it going to hurt? This is the one thing I, I always go back to this analogy. You know, we're so brave in sports. I mean, God, people get dropped from a helicopter onto these waves that are 100 feet tall. And they surf this, you know, where they could just get crashed and die. And they never think twice about it. They go down these black diamond hills and kids take their, I don't know, skateboards off the top of a roof. They don't think about this. Date somebody, open your heart. Oh my God, I might get hurt. I might get hurt. What is this? Why can we, we be so adventurous in one area and not in another? We just need to develop our skill set so that we don't fear this and so that we know that we can handle it. Thank you so much, Gary. And I, I don't think... I'm glad that she didn't want to hurt you. And I think that's a testimony to the fact that you're a really nice guy. She probably felt badly about not knowing what she wanted and didn't want to waste your time and then went on with her life. But at least she didn't want to hurt you. Um, Lisa. Okay. we got. Oh, my goodness. we got a lot of them coming in. Lisa, a 55, whatever that is. And okay, I don't know what that is. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Hello. I met a guy a month ago, and we don't have a serious relationship yet. But he said that he doesn't want me to meet other guys. How should I react to it? Okay, I would negotiate. So nobody's allowed to reserve you and put you in a box unless you, one, agree to it. And two, then you come back and counter with what you want and what you need. I'm all about negotiation. It, it doesn't have to look like you're at a boardroom table. It can be very off the cuff and natural. But if you like him, you might want to say, Lisa, I like you too. And I'll tell you what. I understand that you don't want me to meet other guys. So you're not going to be meeting other girls too. Is that correct? Is this what we're doing here? I'm willing to try it if you are, but it's got to be both ways. Then go a step further. So uh, are you wanting me to go off dating apps? If so, maybe then we should both go off dating apps because I'd like to get to know you, but it can't be one-sided. If you meet me halfway, we can explore this together. Okay? So that's how you handle that. All right. And in a way, I'd rather he's at least trying to lock you down a little bit. That's a positive sign. Make sure it goes both ways. Lisa, thank you so much. And if I miss anybody, I will come back to you. Oh, okay. Who is this? Oh my goodness. $50 genetic freak. Wow. Holy shit. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. Oh my God. Thank you. Um, thank you. Wow. I'm, I can't even believe this. Okay. Um, I got rejected by my dream girl. She's a 31-year-old, beautiful lawyer in New York City. So I know she has access to top 10% of men, i.e. men much better looking, taller, wealthier than me. How do I cope with inferiority knowing I wasn't good enough for her? Okay. First of all, I have a couple of questions. Did you date her and did you go out with her? Because if you dated and went out with your girl, or if you even had sex with her. I mean, Genetic Freak 84, you did pretty well. You kind of, you know, grabbed the tail of the tiger. So you are in the category of competing with men that you think are far more desirable than you are. And I know New York City dating pretty well. So if she's 31 and she's beautiful and she's a lawyer and she has access to the top 10% of men in New York City, let's review what the top 10% of men in New York City actually want. Until they are ready to settle down and make a commitment, they will run through as many women as they can because they can. 
they got a corporate account, and especially the financial service guys have homes in the Hamptons. And there's a lot of monkey branching of the girls. And so they don't take the women very seriously. As spectacular as you believe this woman to be in your world, she is one of thousands, thousands of young female lawyers in New York City. Female lawyers, financial service ladies, CEOs, partners, venture capitalists, uh, heads of ad agencies. Women are profound in their ability now to enter the world and really make a stance for themselves. So while she to you is the one, she is in my estimation, this is not about her character and her personality, she is one of many of that profile. It doesn't matter how many men want to date her, what man is gonna make a commitment to her? And this is where you can shine ahead of all the other guys. A lot of these women at a certain point just get exhausted by going through the revolving door of rich, successful young men with an expense account that can wind them, dine them, sleep with them, and discard them and put them into rotation. This happens. You can't believe the men I work with in New York that tell me these stories. It's almost so despicable. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying to help them, and I'm just like, oh, my God. But this is the lay of the land. And women are seven to one in New York City. And coming to New York City is a playground. But remember, men don't commit until they're ready. And then at that moment, after they've run through everything and had all the fun that they want, they've gotten it out of their system. And then they're like, you know what? I've discovered in order to be a partner at my law firm, you really should be married or to be in financial services at the level that I want. I'm more trustworthy if I'm married. So now's the time to pick a wife. And then it happens rather quickly. So what you think she is experiencing and what you think your competition is may not be what your competition is. Bottom line is be a man of quality, know where your real value lies in what you're offering, continue to achieve, be successful, be proud of whatever it is that you do and stop running with the other men. It's as ridiculous as me trying to compete with 20 year old women. That's insane. I can't run that race. I got to run the race where I shine the most. Figure out your most stunning human qualities that are of value, that you appreciate. Lead with that. You're in New York City. You can't be unambitious there. Do the best. Do your passion. Show up and quit worrying about the other guys and start to think more of yourself, okay? And thank you so much. And Genetic Freak, I'd love to work with you. Want to work privately? Let me know, okay? Because I'll be back in New York doing one-on-ones in June. All right. Uh, that means in person. Thank you so much for your contribution. That's incredible. And um, Celestial Satan. Oh, well, that's interesting. Four ninety nine. Thank you very much. A man I was dating broke his arm in an accident. I know he's going through a lot. He's been distant since. Should I reach out or leave, leave him be? Depends on what you had before and where you're going with this. It sounds like you didn't have much time to date him. I'm guessing maybe you had a few little interludes romantically. And now he's pulling back. What we're trying to figure out, is this the excuse to pull away? Because you need clarity. All you need to know is stay or go. And sometimes we don't want to ask directly. So one more time, I'd ask him how he feels, make sure, check in, make sure he's okay. And try to get a barometer. You might even, if you feel like it, if you want to just cut to the chase, you may say, look, I, I like you and I've enjoyed seeing you. I've enjoyed getting to know you. I... I'm kind of unclear as to whether this is something that we want to continue. I, I would like to continue to see you, but I need to know your position on that. It, because the thing is, we don't want to pester and bother somebody. You might tell him that my default is if I feel there's a lapse in time, I automatically go to no contact and leaving somebody. I'm not really sure that I want to do that without checking in with you first. So uh, a break in the pattern of connection to me, even though you have a, a plausible reason, makes me think there's a lack of interest. And before I act on that, I don't want to auto respond, act on that. I want to just clarify. And that's cool. If you're not interested, let's, uh, that's, that's cool. I just need to know. If you are interested, then please help me to understand. And that's all I need to say to you, okay? Um, 
Okay, Chris, I just found this, 999, thank you. Should I write my ex and tell her I love her after seven months, after she said never to contact her again, and she never offered no consolation when my mom died three months ago? I should move on, but unsure. Okay, Chris, there's a whole lot that happened in here that I don't know what happened. Um, I'm guessing she dumped you, I'm guessing, okay? Unless you did something horrific to her. If you were the one that created an event that was so horrific that she had to break up with you, she deserved an apology, but ASAP. Um, if she does not want contact with you, it is either because she has decided, she has made a decisive um, um, pivot that she knows everything you have to offer and doesn't want it. In that case, I'd say, do not go there. Let it go and let go of her. If you think there is something unresolved, that you owe her an apology, that you have changed, that you know you were addicted to, I don't know, oxycodone and now you're not, that if you, whatever, if you had a problem that got in the way of the relationship that's been altered, that is one of the reasons why she broke up with you, then you need to let her know. Okay. But these are a little tricky because there are about 10 more questions I would need to ask you to really answer this. But after seven months, actually, if your mother died and this person cared about you at all, and they know about it, the humane thing is to at least say, God, I, I know we didn't re work out, but I am so sorry. But the fact that they didn't means they really don't want contact with you. Okay. So that's how I'd go with that one. Thank you very much. Um, let's see, here we go. Okay, I did this. I'm thinking I'm, hi, L. Vance, did you leave me a question? <laughs> let me make sure I haven't skipped any of these. And moderators, if I, if I do miss something, please let me know because sometimes these come in in a way that I'm reading them and I think I've caught them. I got Gary, we got Lisa. Uh, we have done uh, Genetic Freak, and I thank you, I thank you, I thank you. We've done Chris, Celestial uh, Satan, uh, and L. Vance. El Vance, did you have a question for me? Thank you for your contribution. Um, I love the fact that you're all speaking to each other, and <laughs> somebody's talking, I met her in Equinox Gym in Manhattan. Uh, yeah, listen, um, we all have that person that we think is our one and only like, the, oh my God, they're so amazing. I'll never meet anybody like this again. And then, you know, we meet somebody like that. Xavier, hi, I think you're the first time uh, on the live show with us. So we want to thank you. I met a guy on a dating app. I took him to the Marine room for our first date. He was overly concerned whether I liked fancy things and kept calling me fancy. Communication faded. I was direct. He said yes to a second date. So Xavier, it sounds like I don't know what the Marine Room is, so forgive me. Maybe that's like the hottest spot in Manhattan. I haven't been there in a while. I don't know. But um, this whole thing about fancy and him getting a little sketchy with that, it could be that he feels inferior to you on a social or an, on an economic level. This is what happens sometimes that um, fancy people are people that are high maintenance and it sounds like this partner, I'm glad that he said yes to a second date. Go get a pizza. Go do something that'll make him feel more comfortable. I, I, I don't know if he's a guy that just works, you know, from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. And then he's off and he's driving a service truck home. He's, he might have a whole different mentality if you take him to a, um, uh, the Marine Room and maybe it's very, very fancy and, you know, um, uh, tablecloths and, and sterling silver and all that, that might've been uh, a hurdle that he didn't think he could jump. So glad you got a second date. Thank you for coming on to the show. Thank you for the $20. I would try to do the opposite. You probably took him to the Marine room because you wanted to impress him and it actually scared him. He probably thought, gee, I don't know if I'm good enough for this guy. He lives a lifestyle. I'm not sure I can live. I don't know that I can keep up with it. So there's a little inferiority there, maybe economic insecurity. Take them for a pizza and a beer. And I think you're going to have a great time. And I wish you well. And thank you so much for this. 
Data. I was going to say ta-da. Okay. Five euros and 49 cents. <laughs> That's adorable. Hi, I'm a 28-year-old female and afraid of staying single forever because everyone my age is getting married. Okay, I am also overweight and get rejected all the time. Okay, there's a lot going on here and these are self-esteem issues and how we see ourselves. Body image is huge. Okay, I've lived under the burden of that since I was 13 and bodies that look like this were suddenly out of style and bodies that looked like this were in style. You know, like Twiggy, that plagued my whole life. I mean, I had nothing but curves and it just was all at the wrong time. Then we had the Kardashians, oh God, who gave, it a, gave us permission to have a button, have thighs and, you know, thin waists and all that stuff. So um, I see magazines, so I, I counted the other day, I must have done, God, 350 interviews for Elite Daily. And it's an online ladies magazine for millennials. And um, there are always women, large, large women on the covers of these, um, you know, for the photos that they pick. And the integration of a wide variety of what is acceptable as far as body image. You know, we could not have been on television 30 years ago, if we didn't look young, over a 35 year career was pretty much done. We didn't have Botox then, all these adult women were wearing bangs. I mean, it's just so silly. But you had a very short um, career uh, trajectory if you were older. It, it was a real thing. So it was age, it was weight. You couldn't be on a show if you were heavy, if you were a heavy woman. Now I see show after show where the the hosts, they're, they're, they're big ladies. So we are, we, Society is expanding what is normal and what is acceptable and what we find to be beautiful. And we are continually evolving toward a greater inclusivity that involves a wider range of what is the human population. So at 28, you happen to be living right in the center of this movement, which is so wonderful. You don't have to go through 40 years of self-hatred because you get to start now and see that there are many people, like Lean and Dunham, you know, very successful, hardly a small girl. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Uh, the thing about getting married, if that's what you want, you may want to go to a special service. Like, I don't know if you have a special religion that you follow. Um, I know in the Jewish faith, there is an enormous incentive to marry. And it is really um, something that is honored. And it is something that gals that you know, maybe wouldn't have the possibility of having such open-mindedness in another group of people find that because of the community and the values and the morals, there is such a great connection that, you know, that there's just a greater resonance. So if you have somebody who is a matchmaker that you trust, I would test them out. Be very careful who you spend money with. Look at the contract, have somebody do the casting for you and try to I would look at positive role models of people who are like yourself that have done very well and found love. Because remember, love is as unique as we are. And there is no one size fits all. It's not like the five foot nine, 110 pound blonde girl who's white is the only one who gets to be loved. Okay. Everybody gets love. <laughs> Everybody gets love. I just did an article recently for um, this magazine called Patch, where it's a 90-year-old couple, mid-90s, living in a nursing home, decided to get serious. And COVID made them move in together because they used to sneak around to see each other. So they formalized it. 90, they found their partner. So it can happen at any age. It's not about that. And I really wish you well. And I hope that helped you. Um, let's see, we've done you, Xavier. Okay. And we have done Genetic Freak. And I just want to make sure, thank you so much. SM, five uh, CAs, whatever that is. I don't know what all these things are. Hi, Susan, love the channel. Thank you so much, SM. Glad that you're here. Any tips on how to stop comparing ourselves to others? Oh, God. <laughs> oh, jeez. Uh, let's see, my teenage years, my 20s, my 30s, my 40s. Uh, I finally got over it in my 50s. Okay. Uh, if we get rejected by, uh, for better looking people. Okay, so here's the first thing about that. The person that you're choosing 
the types of people you're choosing value looks. If that's not your strong suit, you got to change the pool that you're fishing from. Do you know what I'm saying? So look, at if, if, I, if I started dating men who only value a woman with a PhD, I don't have a PhD. I've got a double major, undergraduate degree. That's it. And I will always be inferior in their eyes. And there's nothing I can do about that. What am I going to do? Try and change them? Or what if I say, you know what? I'm going to look for a man who values honesty, who values independent thinking, who values a woman who is strong and also loving and nurturing. And I'm looking for that guy who would understand somebody like me. Then I have a better shot. So if the people you are choosing keep wanting something else, the question is not your your lack. It's repositioning your guide, your compass, to start focusing on people who can see your value. Do you understand? It's like me trying to date a guy who only wants somebody who, who's young and perfect. I'm not, I'm not young. I'm not perfect. I would be miserable and I would be constantly rejected if that was the grounds upon which we are deciding whether I am worthy to be your mate or not. So that person wants a superficial relationship, okay? You're probably not a superficial person. So look for somebody with depth. What are your skills? What are your passions? Are you great at music? That's where you go. Are you great at painting? Are you super on gaming? That's where you need to go, not people who need pretty, okay? Pretty is lovely, but pretty doesn't build a relationship. Okay. Oh my goodness. Zeth, 499. How to take off my heart this man I have to see daily? We had intimacy twice. I fell for him, but he only calls, reaches out for sex. Okay. Zeth, if that is something that makes you feel horrible about yourself, the price you're paying to be with this person is not worth it. If it you know, listen, this is a bigger discussion for all of you out there. Those of you who are trying desperately to modulate yourself and put yourself into a tiny, tiny little box and be okay with having casual sex because it's the mode and it's what people do nowadays. And if that isn't true and right for you and you come away feeling like shit, you don't do that. That's not your thing. You have to learn. I tried. I tried and tried and tried to be modern. I tried to be less. I tried to throw my body in the bed and, and have the rest of me. I, I can't. It's, it's, a, it, it's all together. It's, it's like one-stop shopping. It's all here, and I can't, I can't go there if I can't go here and I can't go there. I, 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 it's just not going to happen. So stop doing what doesn't work. So that was one of my other points. These are my points. So, uh, so you stop picking uh, partners. This is a negative pattern, okay? When you see a negative pattern, get out. Make another choice. And not just get out. Make a concerted effort, Seth, that the next time that you are going to look for somebody who doesn't want you, like, uh, on speed dial for sex, somebody who actually likes you, can't wait to talk to you, can't wait to get together for a cup of coffee, thinks you're amazing. That's what you want. This is not what you want. You can easily walk away from what you don't want because you don't want this. Okay? Hope that helps. Thank you. Okay. Oh, we got a lot of them. Tina Z, 499. Tina, if you have a question for me, thank you so much. I want to make sure that I see all of these. Um, live uh, now 13, 499. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Johnny Rico. Johnny, 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 Johnny. Oh, my God. Johnny Rico. I love you, love you, love you. This is Johnny, Johnny, Johnny. So sometimes you see me when I'm doing these new technical things and you'll see a guy in the background. That's Johnny. Johnny is my, is my dear friend, uh, my most wonderful person. I'm so lucky to live a block away from him. And he's my rock. He's my solid guy. He's wonderful. And I'm so happy. I'm, I've never seen him on a live show. So Johnny, back soon. Love you madly. Can't wait to see you. Um, he, brilliant. Um, he's a little famous. I've got to tell you. So. Um, he was a lead guitarist in Warrior Soul on Geffen Records. He's a pilot. Ladies, 
Ladies, if you're in New York City, you will never meet a finer man. This is a good man, a faithful man. When you see his resume, you're like, this guy can't possibly be into monogamy. He is excellent. Just saying, Johnny, I know this isn't a dating service for you, but I'm just saying, ladies, listen, DM me, contact me, and I'll run it through Johnny first, but he is incredible. So Tina Z, hi, Susan. How do you cope with disappointment after multiple unsuccessful dates when it starts to feel like you'll never meet your person? I'm 39 and I'm struggling with the current dating culture. My dear, who isn't? <laughs> Tina, you speak for everyone out there. First of all, if you are exhausted, if you are getting negative returns, I want you to get off that revolving door of pain, take a break, take a chill pill, get off. Stop, stop. We never practice what is wrong. Do not practice a bad swing in golf. Do not practice an errant hit in tennis. Don't practice a mistake. Don't practice failure. We don't want to ingrain that in our body. You are going to want to take a chill, get away. Don't make a decision, yes or no, about it. You don't have to say I'm done forever. Just put it aside. Take a month or two off. Hike. See friends. Now that you can move around the world, most of the world, take a vacation, take a trip, ride a horse, do some poetry, pick up a guitar, yeah, do something. Just shift your world, shift what you're doing, make a concerted effort to do something differently, to add new things to your life, things that you didn't know about, things you want to explore, try investing in yourself. Then when you feel like it, go back and see what happens, okay? Johnny, I hope I didn't, I hope I didn't embarrass you. Let's see if he's still gonna to talk to me in here. I'm gonna see if he's probably gonna say, Susan, don't say anything, a great show. And thank you, Susan, of course, my dear. I love my Johnny, love my Johnny Rico. Okay, I think I might have missed somebody in here. Um, okay, I, I wanna make sure that I've caught all your super chats. Sometimes they come very, very quickly. Um, Zeth, okay, did I miss this one? Oh, oh, I did. Um, okay, Nia Hanke, hi, uh, 50, and I think that's, I don't know what the DKK is, maybe it's, I don't know, um, Dutch, I don't know, it's, uh, um, rejected five years ago, broken heart, have since had a secure relationship. Okay, single again, worried that this guy will stay stuck in my head in future relationships. Okay, I think what you're saying is that there is somebody from your past with whom you were involved that is, you're kind of not over. You, you, you wanted more, you feel rejected and you wanted a different scenario. Here's how I'd play this. And this goes back to in the beginning where it said change the narrative. I want you to take an inventory of what this guy that you liked, but the one who's kind of the prototype now, Take an inventory of who he is and what worked. Was he kind? Was he thoughtful? Did he make you laugh? Was he ambitious? Was he kind to his grandmother? Was he, did he save doggies? I mean, what was it about him that made you feel so connected to him? Was he kind and honest to you? When you can identify those things, you're going to keep those as the gifts of awareness that he left you and you are going to hold those in your hand like this is my little treasure. He gave me these gifts. He's not here now because we've got an upgraded version on its way. So, but I've got the little gifts that he gave me. And I know that these are the component pieces of what I want to experience in the future. So I am looking for this plus, you tell the universe, plus I want somebody who wants to stay with me. I want somebody who is going to be that I can build a future with. And so all of this, plus surprise me, give me things I didn't even know I'd like and know I'd want. Okay, so that's the cure for that because holding on to somebody means that we, we are trying to hold on to those qualities that we like so much about them. But we, we can have those, we just need to have them reformulated in the new package of the person who wants to be with us. And thank you, Nia, for this, I appreciate it. And so I'm scrolling back to see if I've missed anything. 
okay, we did this, SM. I did this for the better looking people. And I hope I did this, Joanna. Oh, oh okay, I missed this. Uh, Joanna J, he claims I'm first date, seven years uh, divorced. I feel bad because he is against shopping around while I'm protesting all possibilities. Advice. Okay. So Joanna, you have a good guy, but I have to wonder, the fact that you're writing this, even though you have a good guy, you may not be ready for a relationship because otherwise you'd jump on this. So it's a couple things here. Either you are hung up on somebody in your past and they're kind of residual and you haven't been able to get over them. So you're, you're out there looking around, but you're really like your heart someplace else. Or it could be that you want additional qualities that this person does not possess. And although you recognize this is a good choice, this is a safe choice, I probably should pay attention to this, but something, uh, something's not working for me. So many times, and I should do a show on this because this is important. So many times we come across that person where we've had some negative people, we've had heartache, and we're like, okay, this one won't hurt me. God, I wish I could feel attracted to them. And you just don't. And so the question is, am I, am I uncomfortable expanding into a new pattern of healthy? Or do they really not have enough? And I want to like them because they are safe and they look good and they're into me, but I'm just not that into them. So uh, I would negotiate. Joanna, this did, okay, let me back up. It depends on what you want. Do you want a relationship? Because this guy was married and he probably, if you're the first one in seven years, he's been looking a long time and he wants you. So it's kind of unfair to keep him dangling. If you really, in your heart of hearts, know that you don't want a relationship at all, it's kind of unfair. You could just say, you know, our timing is just off. I'm still, I just got out of something. I need to play the field. Happy to see you. Don't want to hurt you. It's your call. So you could negotiate that way. Or you could, but you really have to ask yourself, what do you want? Do you want to give this guy a shot? Negotiate. Say, I understand, but can you give me another month? You know, I had a client that she had been a virgin. I have a lot of virgins. I, I, and they keep telling me I need to do a video just for them, but it's true. I haven't, you know, I didn't think it was a big thing, but it's a big thing. And um, she didn't have much experience. And then she finally gets with a guy. And he's insecure and he's controlling. And he demands that in one month she become exclusive. She had just started to date. She didn't even have a chance to select. And he got a hold of her and he was a nightmare from day one. It took us about nine months to, to shake her loose, to get her empowered, to, to know that she had a choice and to not be hustled into being locked down just because it's their insecurity. So if you sense that it's his insecurity, you do need to take your time. So I do my best and I try to give you five to seven different answers because the questions I need to ask you, I would ask you in a private session that would give you the exact answer. So forgive me when I get some of your questions, I will shoot it considering every possibility of what I don't know. But then the good news is that all of you listening might go, oh my God, she said my situation. I like that. So I hope this helps you. Thank you so much for that. Um, Allie Parker, $5. Okay. How may I prompt a man to talk about his feelings, any topic without him powering down? Hmm. One guy, just one guy doesn't want to share. Um, so why don't you start about what's he passionate about? Uh, hockey sports. I mean, what's the guy into? Uh, it could be that he doesn't talk at all. I have met guys like that. I can't, no matter how nice, how faithful, they don't talk. That's just not one of the things they do. They don't have that skill. And so somebody like me is really struggling to keep a connection because I need that. I need, I need this. I need this. I need, I, I need it. Um, start with what um, I know you want to talk about his feelings. You have to go back to, having him talk in general. And you're gonna to have to read between the lines. It's a long process from getting a man to talk to getting him to talk about his feelings about you and the relationship. Start with his hobbies and interests, get him going, 
lead him to where he goes off for five minutes and starts talking about stats and figures and this game and that game or whatever he's into his, his job, his creativity, whatever, let him talk and talk and talk and say, Oh, that's cool. Get in alignment with him and see if he doesn't feel closer to you. And then you can start to lead it from that space where he is passionate into test the waters into greater ideas, philosophical, you know, uh, societal current issues. And then just because you got to get the ball going before you can get it in this specific arena. Okay. I hope that helps you, Ali. Thank you so much for this. Uh, let's see. I think I've read everybody. Moderators, let me know if I've left anybody out. Um, LaVance and uh, let's see, did you have any question for me? I know you've made a contribution. I do appreciate that. Um, let's see. Johnny Rico, I hope you get a lot of girls following you because you are kind of amazing. <laughs> okay, let's see what's going on here. Joanna, okay, there we go. I just want to make sure, SM, your channel, stop comparing ourselves to other people. Yeah, boy, that's a, that's a big one, huh? Uh, let's see. Nia, okay, and Zeth, I think that's it. Uh, Tina Z. Hi, Tina. If you, uh, thank you so much for this. If you have a question, let us know. Live Now 13, thank you so much for your contribution. Oh, Tina Z. I did answer that. I did. Thank you for that. I found it anyway because it was well written and um, I could mark it underneath here. Let's see. Um, I love the fact that my moderators are speaking to all of you because um, they're very smart. I mean, these are people that you know, I've either worked with them personally or I know them and um, I know that they're coming from a really, really great place. Christina, uh, 50. Hey, Susan, met a guy at work during a business trip. He kept telling me how much he likes me and how special I am. But when I told him he turned my world around, he told me to take care of myself. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. You entered uncharted territory. He didn't want to go there. I think he was flirting with you a business trip. Okay. So let's look at this business trips. You know, a lot happens when you leave that um, hotel bar and you're going up in the elevator and you've just had one too many. And then you see, oh my goodness. Okay. Suddenly you get a smooch from Jay in accounting and you didn't expect it. So this is very common. Business trips are a place that some people test the waters, whether they flirt whether they do emotional cheating or whether they actually push it all the way to the level to have a little fumble or even a sexual affair. This is one of the known places that that will happen. Now, uh, when you told him that he turned your world around, I'm guessing that you now have a crush on him. I don't know if you know him well from work or what the situation is. When he told you to take care of himself, that could be code for, it was fun flirting with you, but you went way off the deep end. I am not ready for this. By the way, I got a wife and three kids, so this is not happening anymore, okay? He's done flirting. Take it for what it is. I don't know why he turned your world around. All he did was tell you you were special. So the remedy to this is I want you to get up every morning and I want you to look in the mirror and I want you to say, you know what? I'm special. I'm special. Gary from accounting thinks I'm special. And I got to find out what he sees that I have not been acknowledging. So today, I'm going to look for evidence that I'm special. And I'm going to notice, did I go out of my way to hold the door open for somebody that had groceries? Was I thoughtful when somebody was in pain? What makes me special? Was I astute in my perception about a problem at work that nobody else could get? If he thinks I'm special, then I must be special. So let me recognize that so he no longer has so much power over me. Because the more you realize you're special, you'll be less thrown for a loop like, oh my God, somebody thinks I'm special. Because we, we've got to think we're special. Not in a haughty way, but just, you know, we've got to like ourselves enough, okay? So thank you so much for that. And I hope that answered your question. Ben Minneapolis. Hello, hello, hello. $10. Thank you so much. How about be what you want? 
can you just like do this for me? I'll be quiet and you write, okay? Because this is perfect. As in, if you value attractive women, they too probably only are deeply attracted to actual physical attractiveness. Rejection less likely under such parity, right? Um, I'm The way I'm reading this is to become the person that you admire. Become, if we've got somebody in our life that has rejected us, let's say, and well, first of all, you are correct. But it, to take this in a, a little bit broader context, somebody rejected you. They were awesome. They were like, oh my God, I can't believe I actually had a chance with this and I blew it. I don't know why he, she didn't want me. Uh, you know, I, I just had, it just didn't turn out the way I wanted to. What is it about that person that I value so much? What do they symbolize to me? Okay, sometimes we have given them a quality that they don't really possess because we're projecting it onto them. But just go back and analyze what is it about them. Do a little paperwork, please. This is how you find out all of this stuff. So you go back and you say, what is it about them? Oh my goodness, this person is so ambitious. Why do I respect that so much? Because I'm ambitious. So I honor that in them, therefore I honored it myself. And what if you say, because they are so dedicated as an athlete. They get up at five in the morning, they run, they watch their diet. Oh my God, I've been such a pig. I've been eating, I haven't been exercising. I don't, you know, I have no right to complain. If I don't get up at five in the morning and do what they do, how dare I feel badly that I look the way I look. So then they would be motivation for you. So what in that case that you like is not the resonant you that's the same, but it's that other quality that they have that you wish you could possess. And possessing them makes you feel like you possess that quality. But we can't take the person and what they represent to us and, and, and take them into our system and have them and possess them. That doesn't give us that power, okay? And they don't withhold it from us. It is just that they are the symbol of that and it's the thing that we need to cultivate within ourselves. So this is where a little bit of your research should come into play. I hope that helps you. And, th and thank you, Ben, for this. I do appreciate this. Joanna J, 499, where are you, my darling? Okay, thanks, Susan. I'm recovering from a toxic relationship. I need time to build a support community. Is it wrong to have male friends if I decide to proceed with him? Um, Joanna, is this from another conversation that I missed because I don't want to miss this? Um, if you had another conversation I uh, I don't know who him is, so this is my problem here. Um, is him, maybe mean them. Okay, recovering from a toxic relationship, good for you. You got out. Two, building a support community, excellent move. That's perfect. Um, is it wrong to have male friends if I decide to, I think you mean decide to proceed with them. If they are in right order. I just had a discussion on Clubhouse this morning about emotional cheating. And the question is always, uh, for me, I have this term, it's a Susanism, but I call them a lover in waiting. So you hear a lot of these terms I use, I, I've created the word the dream and this whole, I, I use my own words for things, but it's, it's like a lover in waiting is a person who's pretending to be a friend because they're just waiting for the time that either you're ready for a relationship or that they have the confidence to bust a move. Uh, so, if you feel that these men, these male friends and get female friends too, Joanna, are in integrity and they're to truly support you, because right now you probably don't need a romantic relationship, not this moment. Maybe next week, maybe three weeks from now, maybe two months from now. But if you're just newly recovering, you want to be with safe people that aren't using your vulnerability as a point to connect with you. So what you want is to make sure that everybody's in right order. And in that case, if you have supportive men in your life that are wonderful and by your side, like that's my Johnny, Johnny Rico, is that for me? He's a guy I can count on. He's a fine, wonderful, upstanding man. <laughs> He's my hospital husband. <laughs> Uh, you know, I have a, a, a rotation of men that I call when they have to pick me up from like medical procedures or they have to check me out of the hospital because it's a liability. They're so sure I'm going to slip and fall on my way out and I'm going to like sue them for something. So, you know, you got to have somebody pick you up that you trust, right? So having a good, solid, solid person 
like like I do with Johnny. Like if you can find that kind of a guy that's in right order, would never abuse you, only has your best interest, then that's that's a good thing. So make sure that you know their intention. Okay. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, let's see, what do we have here? I think I've done most of these. Have I missed anything? I think that's pretty good. I love the fact that you're all talking to each other. Oh, Jonathan Aslay. Jonathan is here. Hello, Jonathan. If you don't know Jonathan Aslay, he is here. He is a relationship coach that helps women. And it's always great to hear it from the guy's point of view. I I do men and women, um, straight, gay, doesn't matter. And, you know, even uh, way outside the norm relationships, cutting edge relationship models, but it's always wonderful to have somebody, you know, sometimes women just really want to hear from a guy, hey, what's really happening here? Because men know men and women know women. So, he, oh, here we go. Thomas. Hello, Thomas, my dear. Thomas Sally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 10,000. Oh, my goodness. Baby, I'm a rich girl. Now, I'm telling you, people are so generous. Dear Susan, happy to be here again. And we are happy to have you. Uh, question. After reconciliation, when do you think it's the right time to discuss past issues or events? Everything is great, but my mind sometimes wants answers. How, why, when, sneaky behavior, why lying details. Okay. In your case, here's what I'm going to suggest. If you have had a treacherous road with a partner and you had heartbreak, time apart, and you have finally come back together again, and it is good, close that door. Just close it. You need to ride the wave of the new place and let the other go. You are not the same person as you were in the past. And this person, when you want to go back into time, they're not the same person either. So when we've had a tumultuous backstory with somebody and we have finally gotten it to a place of beautiful, clean, authentic forward movement, we don't want to go back in and ask why, because now we're bringing the garbage into this fresh water. File it away in your mind. It's not like... It's not like that never happened. We know that. And it's not like that person doesn't have that potential to do that again. But right now, for you, I would suggest get this to be the new norm. Healthy, loving, optimistic. Create a new future. Leave that stuff in the past. It doesn't matter. Right now, it doesn't matter. Okay? So... It is, it is very hard if we have a partnership with somebody and all we're talking about are the problems. And I think I, oh golly, I did, I did a video on this and I, do you know, I lost my flash drive on the airplane this weekend and it had like 200 videos on it. I, I mean, I know I can get them off YouTube, but what a pain to have to go and download each one of them. It's got episodes from TV shows that I probably can't get copies to. So it, it's just, but I know I did a show on, like how to fix it without talking about it. So sometimes you're at a point in your relationship where if you've had a difficult past, the last thing you want to do when you get to good, still, beautiful, clean water is to start making waves again. You don't want that. So you, you, you want to actually fix things without talking about it. And in a case like this, it is really important to establish new memories of positive experiences. If we're always going back and talking about the negative things, our partner begins to associate being with us with constant bickering and we're never good enough. And they're always, you know, you don't know if they come from a past where they, they are really sensitive to criticism, where they felt they weren't enough. These things happen. So stay in the fresh, clean water until something comes up. And then try to look at it from today's information because Time changes people and awareness changes people. And we can't always predict that who they were in the past is exactly the same as who they will be today. People have a dispositional trait that is consistent. We can't change that. But, it, but they may have learned. They may have grown. You know, they may have better information now. And they may have decided to show up in a better way in this relationship for you because they want it. 
So we have to allow them to proceed forward. It's like, it's like if you have something against somebody and you hold them there, you're never able to release them to be who they're trying to be today. Okay, so that's really very helpful. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Thomas. I hope that helps you. Um, did I miss that? What did you say? Okay, um, okay. Mr. Cricket, $5. Thank you, Mr. Cricket. Um, had a good first date yesterday with an interesting girl. I think she had fun too, but now she's off studying for a month. Such a big gap, a month. She better be having the finals or defending her thesis. I mean, this is like, this is crazy. Okay, a month off. So because you had a great first date, what you're really saying is, I don't know if she likes me and she is actually busy or if she is blowing me off and doesn't have the courage to say it. Either way, here's all we do know. She probably won't tell you if you asked her straight up and she'd probably think it was really invasive if you did, but you have the option, you have the option to do that. You could, you could, one option, if you want to be absolutely honest and say, I liked you and I liked our first date. I just need clarity in my experience. When somebody says they're taking a month off, it's normally a very polite slow fade. And that could exactly be the case. I need to know the lay of the land. Um, I will not take offense. There's no wrong answer. I just want to know, are you interested in continuing this a month from now or are we good? And if she says, I think we're good. Then you have your resolution. Otherwise, date other people. Don't give her that much of a elevated position. Put her in the back burner and don't even attend to this until she comes back. That's a long time for you to wait around, okay? And it was only a first date, so you don't really have any agreement to be with each other, all right? Is such a big gap between dates good? Not if you're trying to create forward movement, okay? And let's see. All right, I think, Anya, hi, five. Thank you so much. Um, hi, Susan, do you think there's a shift happening in terms of relationships? In general, are people becoming more aware and learning how to be better partners? Yes, yes, yes. And if anything else, um, the hookup culture has absolutely demanded that people figure stuff out. Because when the entire system of committed relationships and the protocol of dating and courting, in my time period, I didn't, we'd get fooled once in a while, you'd get your heart broken. But there wasn't a single guy that came into my life that didn't want a committed relationship. And unfortunately, most of them wanted marriage, which I didn't want from age four. Committed relationship, okay. Marriage, no, didn't want it, didn't want it. So I was the girl that always got, you know, these questions and my poor father. But of course, when you eradicate all that and during 2000 onward, when we blew it up and we said, we don't want roles, we don't want cardboard cutouts, we don't want these, you know, little things that we're supposed to play like the, the husband does this, the wife does that, the girlfriend does this, the boyfriend does that. We don't want any of that anymore. We want to be free. We want to be ourselves. We want to do whatever, whatever. And we want to release this whole sexual tension around sex only belonging to a relationship. When we got there, everybody was in a, a terrain that had nothing but mind, mind, like what do you call those active bombs? Like it was a minefield, right? You never knew step to step when it was going to blow up on you. And people became petrified, disillusioned, uh, disheartened. I mean, it's been a very rough 20 years. Do I see change? Yes. Two things back to back. Um, COVID really made people slow down. The one positive thing about COVID is that we started to take more time to get to know somebody because we couldn't rush it into the sexual, we couldn't go right to sex. And in the last 20 years, it's been sex first, figure out what you want to do later. And that's where the whiplash has come because there's no safety net for anybody. There's no discussion. There are a lot of assumptions and there are tons of hopes and no conversation. And then ghosting became okay. It became a word that we now accept as behavior, as an option to telling the truth, right? So it couldn't have gotten much worse. So now the pendulum is swinging the other way in that people are becoming more conscious. People are becoming more intentional. There are awakened men. There are conscious men. 
There are men who want loving, committed relationships. There are men who value a woman with a positive mindset and a growth mindset. There are women who value um, certain aspects in men that aren't any longer chasing the wild horse, that that is no longer something like, wow, that's, that's not exciting. I, I want to date the guy that's going to be there for me. That's exciting. That's exciting. So it is changing. People are becoming more aware because we have a glut of information. YouTube has been spectacular. I had no guidance when I was involved with a younger man. There were no books on the, there was nobody to talk to. I was an outcast. I barely had a therapist that understood me. She was gracious to me, but I was universally hated or reviled or, you know, I was, the, I was like a leper. Nobody want, it was like, it would be contagious. This, this thing that I did was so horrific that I fell in love with somebody younger. <laughs> just life is so crazy. The very thing to hate you for you become famous later. I mean, it's just, this is, this only in America could this happen, right? So it is changing. Take heart. People are aware. This glut of information it is entering our social consciousness. And every day we are learning more about self-awareness. We are learning to actualize our dreams. People are getting on board with spirituality, whether it's law of attraction or it's just being an ethical and good and fine human being. People are doing the passion that they love. People are hopefully living in their integrity. At least it's in the language that we're using today. So I think people have gotten exhausted from dating with little true tangible worth. When you date, when you go out there, you want to feel that your time and your energy has been spent in a way that is productive and that you are having some kind of mutual uh, co-creative relationship. And if you keep going out and showing up and people aren't, you're gonna become exhausted. But everybody got exhausted. So yes, this is a very long, yes, 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 this is a very long yes. And I'm going to have to close down pretty soon. Um, I've got another show on the list. I love these people at ABC. They keep calling me. So that's really wonderful. I have to look fresh and perky for that. You guys. I have to go over my notes. So Anya, thank you for this. Uh, let's see. David. Hi, 999. Thank you so much, David. Met a guy. He isn't ready for a long distance relationship in the near future. Doesn't want to lose me. It would hurt him if we stopped talking. I like him. We get along very well when we meet in person. Do I wait? The word near future is very vague and it's, it's pretty seductive. Um, he sounds like somebody you get along well with him and you have to have some deeper discussions. You do not wait on a maybe. I just did that video the other day. We never wait on a maybe. I think he's giving you I think he really likes you, but he's giving you a soft no. He must have had some experience with long distance relationships where he knows he either can't remain faithful and invested or he just doesn't want them. I don't know how long long distance means. I don't know if it's five hours or I don't know if it's 5,000 miles. I don't know the difference. Um, he isn't ready for a long distance relationship in the near future, but he doesn't want to lose you. Okay. You don't want to lose him either. That's the statement. And you know he doesn't want to lose you. So now you go back to the drawing board and you say, okay, how can we figure this out? If you two are really committed and you are really serious, maybe somebody wants to do a trial visit for an extended amount of time. Are you a freelancer? Are you uh, like a digital nomad? Can you go wherever you want for your work? If you can relocate, why don't you try a month in his city or he try a month in yours? You know, if you think you've found something valuable rather than I don't do long distance, um, should I wait? Neither one are going to work. So you're too polarized. Come back to the middle and start negotiating. What can we do? Because you never wait unless you have the only time that you actually wait is when you're both waiting together to get to the next point. Long distance relationships only work if you are moving in sync together to do everything necessary to finalize where you are so that you can finally be together. 
whether it's that you're finishing your doctorate at a different school, or they've gone back for a business degree, or they had to do one year abroad, and then they come back and you're making the plans for the house and the future and all that. But you have to have the future goals that are locked in. So go back into negotiation and talk to this guy. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think unless... We are, I think I'm going to log off pretty soon. Beef Boat. Oh, Vance. Okay, Vance had two questions. Thank you, Beef for Boat. I didn't see this. Vance. Hi, we've worked together on music, dude. Okay. I called him. He took two weeks to call back. Missed his call. Called back 20 minutes later. He didn't answer. This was last week. I'm done. I've gone no contact to move on. What do you suggest? I say next time he reaches out or what to do now? Been a month since he stopped all contact. Okay, this is a little disjunct for me and I'm having a little bit of a hard time understanding it. Um, thank you, B. This must have been a special question that was asked. Um, so you've got a, a Vance a Vase, Vasi, Quest hype. <laughs> <These names. laughs> um, there's been a lack of motivation on both of your parts, and you have to admit that. And there's been a little game playing. So anybody that takes two weeks to call you back, that is rude. It's rude. It's impolite. So let's let's evaluate that human being on the scale of civil behavior. Not a good. Not a good sign. You're already dealing with somebody who is impolite and inconsiderate. And it shows you that you are not a priority because they're not two weeks. They don't call you back and you're worrying about how to proceed. Now, here's the one thing I would have done differently. Before you go no contact with them, just to get it out of your system for your own closure, I would have, in case there is the slightest bit of hope that they could correct their behavior, that maybe they did an adjustment that somebody told them to do, or they were playing hard to get or whatever. You want to go back to that person and say, you know, I did like you. I wanted contact with you. I was hurt. And it felt very weird that you didn't call back because we had a working arrangement with this music. And that's not okay with me. I'm sorry that that happened. And, and I have to assume that that means that you're not interested in anything going forward. Just so you know, I did want to do something here and I have to, I'm taking your not calling me back as evidence that you do not. So that was a nice session that we had together. I wish you well, goodbye. Cause it's kind of hard to see you. The reason you're writing me is that you never, you never had that goodbye conversation with this person. So you're feeling disempowered. So it's still rambling around in your mind. And this is what we want to get rid of. Sometimes the best way before you go into no contact is to tell them why. It gives them at least the opportunity to correct their course or it's called them out. And they know why now you're not having contact with them because they did something that wasn't in right order. And then, then, it, then you don't have to keep having it live in your head. Do you understand? Everyone, everyone, everyone. Okay, we're going to close this out pretty soon. Oh, Gwyneth. Hello, dear lady, 10 pounds. Dear, dear, dear Gwyneth, thank you. No question. Just out a whole lot of love and a huge thank you for another wonderful show and for being such a beautiful soul. Gwyneth, thank you. Everyone, thank you. Thank you, moderators. Alex, B for Boats, B Ray, thank you so much. I have the very best people on here and I thank all of you for being really such fine human beings. You not only help me to do my job, but whether you know it or not, you affect everyone around you. I see you talking to the people here and helping them. And I know that you do the same when you're out in the world. So I think that it's a bigger thing that we have going on here. The more that we get ourselves in right order and the more that we can be clear on our intention and how we handle ourselves and try to come, you know, be in right order and come from the highest place possible, then that ripple effect affects everyone around us. And sometimes all people need is another option to not be an idiot. They, they don't want to be cruel, but they don't know what to do or another option to not hurt. And so the more you learn, the more you can pass on. 
And for that, I'm exceedingly grateful. Everyone who's contributed, Gwyneth, Johnny Rico, Jonathan Asley, my wonderful moderators, thank you so much for joining me this week. Please know that you have a family here that cares about you. And I could not do this without you. You're all wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'll see you next week. Bye-bye, everyone.